Good afternoon. So I guess we'll get started. Uh, my thanks to Linda Bishai and Mary Greer and the entire ABA Roley team for hosting this great event and inviting me to participate in it. Uh, I'm Steve Kelly. I'm FBI's Chief of Cyber Policy, and I'm pleased to moderate this panel on cybercrime enforcement. Uh, before I introduce our esteemed uh, panelists, I'd like to set the scene. So a cursory glance at the news on any given day will inevitably yield a major story on the cyber threat. Indeed, many of us have become desensitized to the major data breach announcements, stories on election hacks, foreign disinformation campaigns, compromise of national security secrets, and the penetration of critical infrastructure control systems. Uh, the single factor that makes cyber threats more challenging than all others is the fact that the perpetrator is rarely in the same country as the victim. Uh, and internet infrastructure and traffic traverses national boundaries in very inconvenient ways. In response, nations around the world are building up their capacity in network defense, law enforcement, their intelligence service, and their militaries to protect and deter against these threats, and increasingly working together. Uh, in Sujit Raman's uh, keynote this morning, we heard about norms of responsible state behavior in cyberspace. Uh, fighting crime and addressing malicious cyber activity emanating from one's own territory is a fundamental responsibility of states. And while solving cyber crimes remains challenging, the U.S. and its allies have had success in gathering evidence and making cases. Um, with the assistance and support of victims, retained cybersecurity firms, and outside counsel. Um, this panel will explore the current state of play in cybercrime, the importance of cooperation by victims, experiences in international law enforcement assistance, uh, the U.S.'s recent experience in charging state actors with computer crimes, and the effect these efforts are having to reinforce norms and deter destabilizing cyber activity. So let me introduce our panel. Um, we have uh, four guests here uh, covering the spectrum of uh, uh, cybercrime prosecutions all the way through uh, um, uh, private counsel to, to victims. Uh, so we have Mick Stawas here next to me, Deputy Chief for Cybercrime with the Justice Department's Computer Crime and Intellectual Property Section. Next to him is Will Line. He's a cybercrime expert and a liaison officer with the UK's National Crime Agency. He splits his time embedded with the FBI and at the British Embassy. And Luke Dembowski, partner at Debevoise and Plim Plimpton. And then next to Luke is Sean Newell. He's deputy chief for cyber with the Justice Department's counterintelligence and export control section. So welcome panelists. So I'm going to turn it over to each of them. Uh, we'll just go in this order to give a couple of minutes of who they are, a little, a little more detail than what I provided, and, um, and kind of how they come at this topic. So just a little bit of framing, and then we'll get into the substance of the discussion. Nick? Right. So uh, am I on? Yep. So I am the deputy chief for computer crime, so the, really the limiting factors on there are computer and crime. So I am dealing with all of your attacks and intrusions that are conducted for criminal purposes. Not necessarily every attack or intrusion that constitutes a crime, because there's a division in the Department of Justice between those of us who are prosecuting criminal for criminal purposes and those who are prosecuting nation states or terrorists. And that would be, I'm sure you hear more about at the end of the panel. But so all of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act prosecutions in the country come to my office for consultation. And we run an international capacity building program to help improve worldwide capability to fight cybercrime. Um, the iceberg part of my title, as I like to call it, is electronic evidence because it's not actually in my title, but it's actually more of what I do. I help federal law enforcement actually comply with the laws that regulate our collection of electronic evidence, including from networks. And then we try and take those two things, what we know about how people are attacking computers and the laws that restrict the ability to monitor computer networks, and we try and turn that around and be helpful to the private sector in what we call our cybersecurity unit. I was the first head of the cybersecurity unit and have now passed that responsibility to one of my attorneys. So those are three of the big areas that I cover. Thanks, Mick. Will? 
Thanks very much, Steve. Uh, yeah, my name is Will Lyon. I'm from the UK's National Crime Agency, and we lead on all aspects of serious organised crime law enforcement in the UK. Um, I head our cyber liaison team over here in the US. Uh, so we have a team of um, three uh, going up to four people over here embedded in various different locations. Um, Cybercrime is, by its very nature, international, and uh, the US is an incredibly important partner uh, for the NCA um, in uh, in tackling uh, serious organized cybercrime, and uh, yeah, that's that's what uh, me and my team over here in the US do. Hi, and I'm Luke uh, Demboski, and my career in cyber started uh, much like uh, the work that these guys are doing. I worked for 14 years as a prosecutor at the Justice Department, a part of it with Mick in the computer crime section, a part of it with Sean in the National Security uh, Division, um, two and a half years as our representative in Moscow to the Russian government on cyber and other issues. And when I left in 2013, I like to say that I had uh, absolutely all of that under control, and I'm not really sure what has happened since. Um, <laughs> These guys will have to explain that. Uh, for the past three years, I've been um, heading the cyber and data privacy practice at a law firm. Uh, I'm based here in DC. The firm is global. Debevoy is in Plimpton. And so my teams are working on, at any given time, between maybe six and 10 cyber incidents. It could be an insider attack. It could be a nation state attack could be something that came through a vendor or supplier, so we're dealing with a wide mix of incidents all at the same time around the world, and uh, that's uh, my job these days. I'm Sean Newell. I'm with DOJ's National Security Division. Um, Luke, I think the, pr the issue for Russia is we're going to send you back, if that's okay. <laughs> um, we'll get things back it's on track. It's been nice knowing all of you. <laughs> Um, so I'm in the National Security Division. I uh, oversee our portfolio of cyber investigations that deal with uh, nation states and their proxies. For those of you who don't know the National Security Division, uh, we are the uh, department's newest uh, litigating component. We were stood up in 2006 um, following the uh, September 11th attacks. Um, the idea of our standing up the National Security Division had to do with uh, you know, trying to tear down that wall between criminal and intelligence tools and attacking the national security threat. At that time, the primary impetus was the terrorism threat. Um, but we've definitely uh, applied those lessons and uh, methods to a variety of national security threats, including the national security cyber threat, where we use both criminal and intelligence tools to illuminate the threat and figure out how best to disrupt them and kind of manage the criminal unclassified side of the house and the national security like sensitive techniques, uh, you know, use the U.S. intelligence community and things along those lines so we can all work together to, to counter this problem. Great. Well, let's get started. So generally speaking, we're going to start with the cyber crime side, so the pure criminal side, and then we'll work our way through the topics to state activity and uh, norms. So um, Will's going to help us get started. Uh, so Will, can you give us a lay down on the state of play in cyber crime? Yeah, well, I'll, uh, I'll do my very best, Steve. So um, I thought I'd just run through and touch on a few points, uh, probably some just, just some emerging trends that we see in cybercrime at the moment, um, which I'm sure at le hopefully at least some of these will be familiar to, to everybody in the room here. So I think probably the overarching theme is we're seeing increasing levels of sophistication across the board. Um, cybercrime is getting more technically sophisticated by the day. Um, uh, secondly, uh, uh, and probably most importantly, there's been a real lower, lowering of the barrier of entry into conducting cybercrime, which in effect has meant that there's a proliferation of high-end cybercriminal tools and techniques uh, around the world. Uh, Ten years ago, to, to conduct a, a cybercriminal scheme, you needed to be pretty technically sophisticated. You probably needed to be a hands-on coder. Uh, nowadays, you just need to go and know where to look in the right place and buy those things. Uh, bring them all together, uh, and you can conduct a very sophisticated, very impactful cyber criminal uh, scheme. So a really good example of that is uh, criminal cash out. Uh, a few years ago, you'd have to have had a mewling network of people in the countries where you had to make fake cards and all that type of thing. Nowadays, you can just pay some people to, to drop the uh, clean Bitcoin into your account. Um, Thirdly, I think we're seeing increasing levels of collaboration. Something that I think I've definitely noticed recently is that actually lots of cyber criminal networks are all interconnected in a way that we probably didn't realize before. Um, and the reason that they're better than us, uh, cyber criminals collaborate better than us. Um, and there's reasons for that. Um, 
Uh, but yeah, there's certainly connectivity in a way that probably I never used to appreciate. And lots of these cyber criminal groups and networks are all collaborating with each other to an extent that I never really properly appreciated uh, previously. Uh, fourthly, um, I wanted to touch on it, uh, hybrid actors. I mean, we're probably quite a good example of this sitting on the stage is we're split between national security and, and criminal to a certain extent. And, they, and they're generally stovepipes in government. Um, and actually, they're probably stovepipes in, in the private sector and elsewhere. Uh, and there's these structural gaps in our system whereby we deal with something as a criminal threat or a national security threat. And actually, we're seeing lots of uh, what, I, what I would call hybrid type actors uh, that sit in the middle. Um, and that makes delivering a response to those particular individuals really different. So what do I mean by hybrid threat? Uh, criminal actors, for example, who have uh, the support um, or the backing to some, uh, to some extent of, of a nation state. Um, and yeah, that, that makes delivering a response to those particular cyber criminal networks really, really difficult. And that's something that um, we're seeing more and more in, in the criminal space. And I'm sure the, the national security guards will say they're seeing it more coming from the opposite direction. Uh, and then lastly, on the criminal side, I think Steve just asked me to touch on geographical areas. Uh, I think we still see predominantly uh, high-end cyber criminal threats coming from uh, Russia and former Soviet Union countries. Um, but uh, as I mentioned earlier in one of my previous points, the proliferation of those tools mean that cyber-enabled crime, um, crime that uh, you used to commit, uh, say, West African fraud-type crimes you used to commit on the phone or, or through mass mail, uh, is becoming increasingly easier and, and increasingly profitable to do uh, online. So you um, <clears throat> touched on some of this, the specialization that exists within the, I've heard it referred to as the underground economy or the cybercrime underground, and either either Mick or Will. Could you spend a little bit more on that? I, you did mention, like, for, as an example, the cash out uh, business service, but there's a whole bunch of others. Can you touch on a few of those to illuminate? Uh, yeah, I mean, you can go on to the cyber criminal underground um, and buy basically anything. I was describe it. It's a bit like that bar out of uh, out of Star Wars. I've forgotten what it's called now, but you know, it really it, 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 you can get anything you want in there. So um, I don't need to have technical capability in, in anything. I can go in and I can purchase a malware package off somebody. Uh, I can uh, get a service that will spam that malware to, to millions and millions of people around the world. Um, I can get somebody to check that my malware doesn't hit against antivirus vendors. Uh, so you, you know, there's no point spamming malware to millions of people and they're getting blocked by McAfee and Kaspersky and, and, and all the rest of those common AV tools. Um, and then if I want to monetize the access that I get on victims, um, well, I'm just going to pay somebody to do that as well. Uh, so, you know, a really good example in how this is, uh, has proliferated is, is ransomware. Um, I describe it as probably one of the almost like it's, it's getting on towards a perfect crime. Um, you know, a lot of the areas that we used to be able to you know, cash out was obviously uh, a big vulnerability for some groups, because if you wanted to cash out victims in the UK, you needed a money mulling network in the UK, and it involved buying high-end goods and posting them to, to various places around the world, and it's, it, it was really expensive for criminals to do that. Um, nowadays, I'll just drop some ransomware on your machine and, and just wait for you to pay me in Bitcoin. And that's how this proliferation is getting, it, it, it's, like, it's, it's scary in a way. Yeah, and I, I would agree with all of that. And I guess what I would say is, I think it's been even more than just the maturation of the cybercrime marketplace. Like any marketplace, it starts out, build your own, and then you find other people that know how to do something you don't know how to do, and there's some collaboration. And then there became carding forums where there were sort of closed communities that you had to know about and be vouched into in order to kind of enter the criminal underground. The explosion of mass market crime as a service, I think is a direct result of the emergence of Tor Hidden Services. So now, not only do you not have to be a technical person to know how to commit a cyber crime, you don't have to be a technical person to hide yourself online and find the people who will sell you these services. So we see places like Alpha Bay and before it Silk Road uh, having these mass bazaars, and it's true, a lot of what was on those marketplaces are the sorts of things that are hard to buy legally, like illegal narcotics. But there was also a surprising amount of cybercrime as a service on those marketplaces, and it's really made it available to a mass market with a very low skill. You lower that barrier to entry to becoming a cybercriminal to almost zero 
because it's very, very easy to access these very public marketplaces. Yeah, and, and I think you narrow the gap of impact. Um, so a good example of that is DDoS attacks. Uh, I think probably 10 years ago, there was, there was probably only a few intelligence agency nation state type capabilities in the world that could knock a country offline. Um, and a few years ago, some kids sitting in their living room in the UK um, did it. Uh, and they're, they're like 17. Um, was that was that Mariah you're referring to? Uh, yeah, there was, there was when Liberia, the entire country of Liberia, got knocked offline, and some other kids uh, attacked a, a DNS provider and knocked a fair bit of the eastern seaboard of the US offline for a period of time as well from from their living room in the UK. Um, and so you're seeing a narrowing that gap of impact that that these individuals can achieve because of the proliferation of these high-end tools and techniques. Wow. Um, so, uh, Mick, so given, given the global nature and, and also the increasingly high impact of some of these schemes and capabilities, uh, are nations successfully working together to deal with this issue? It, it, that's a qualified answer, Steve. I mean, we, we are working together. That's, that's for sure. We're, we've got a representative from the UK sitting right here who's embedded with the FBI. That's something in and of itself. Um, like I said, my section has been pursuing international capacity building for well over 15 years, where people, including some of the people in the audience here uh, who were, used to be part of my section, would go out and train internationally to build the capacity in other countries. The Council of Europe has been a leader in that as well. Um, but honestly, even though we've had operational successes, things like going back to when Luke was with CSEPS and, and did Game Over Zeus, which there was a lot of international cooperation, those operational successes really relied on individual relationships and our willingness to partner. And I think the movement that I'm seeing is that countries are starting to realize we can't always just rely on the goodwill of another country. We need the ability to effectively investigate international evidence using our own domestic tools. Right now, if you want evidence from the United States, there's somebody who has evidence at, at Google and they want that evidence in the UK, they've got to come to the United States and ask for us to help. And we do our best to help. But we have to teach them concepts like probable cause, that I'm guessing there are probably a fair number of lawyers in the audience today that find that a difficult concept themselves. Try teaching it to someone who doesn't participate in our legal system at all. Um, so we are reaching for ways to improve international investigations where countries have to realize, I'm willing to give up some of my own sovereignty, my own interests some of the control I could exert in order to make other countries more effective in this space. So you've seen the United States do that. We're actively negotiating at the Council of Europe for a protocol to the Budapest Convention. The Budapest Convention is the leading multinational instrument that uh, helps advance cybercrime and electronic evidence. And we're looking at, are there ways that we can sort of let another country use its domestic process to reach uh, evidence in the other parties to the convention. And there are now over 60 parties to the convention. It's been growing rapidly in recent years and including in Latin America, in Africa, in Southeast Asia, there are now parties from all of those regions of the world. It really is becoming a global convention. Um, I guess the, the other thing I would say is some of you may have heard that not too long ago, um, just over a year ago, we passed the Cloud Act, which is an incredibly significant new authority for the United States to enter into bilateral agreements to lift all restrictions. At the Council of Europe, we're talking about things like maybe they should be able to get subscriber information just to find out who's behind an IP address. In the Cloud Act, we would actually enable a partner like the UK to use their own wiretapping, pen trap authority to lift all restrictions because they have a system that has a strong human rights record, that has adequate protections, checks and balances, high standards for privacy. And so why shouldn't they be able to use their own system to investigate domestic crime without the US law standing in the way? So I think that's really the change that I'm seeing that has to do with rule of law is sort of countries recognizing others' authority. 
that's fascinating. Um, so let's pivot a little bit into uh, the role of victims in in um, investigating and dealing with with these issues. We're, we're talking about these investigations kind of in the abstract, forgetting the fact that perhaps that there are uh, major victims here and elsewhere in the world. Uh, Lou, can you help us to understand the, the role of the victim organization in responding to a cyber incident, uh, you know, and what must they consider in, in cooperating with law enforcement to get things moving so that we can begin to figure out who's behind it and impose some consequences? Uh, sure, Steve. So it's, you know, it's complicated and not every victim has the same level of experience working with law enforcement. Um, if you're in the f U.S. financial sector, you're pretty battle-hardened at this point, especially the major players. They've been around the block. They've been part of information sharing and analysis centers and organizations. So they have an idea about how to cooperate with each other and how to cooperate with the government. But even they struggle with these issues because, to continue with that example, they are heavily regulated. And not all parts of even the U.S. government have the same lens or approach when they come at them. Some may think of them less as a victim and more as a party that was derelict in protecting people's uh, private information. And so it's complicated for them. There's a lot of fear and panic. I guess for my role, what's particularly gratifying is in major cyber attacks, you are basically meeting them in their worst moment. You know, there it's, you don't hear the word existential too much for too many things. I suppose terrorist attacks can rise to some level like that, but cyber, it's out there quite a bit as a word with our clients where if this really happened and it hit our entire network and took everything down and we were offline for days, that would, might be the end of us. And they're thinking as individuals, it certainly could take a lot less than that for it to be the end of my job and my career. So they are afraid, and it's a chance to help them think in advance, ideally, through these issues. What does the decision tree look like? People mentioned, uh, you know, uh, Mick and Will mentioned relationships, and I really think that over the course of my now, I guess, 17 years around these cases, the technology has always been interesting, but it's always changing and it's in the background. The bad guys have been interesting and they're changing to some extent, and that's always there. What has been a constant formula for success are relationships, relationships of trust. When, when I was in the CSIPS role or in the NSD role, I would go to a place like um, the European Cybercrime Center in The Hague on an operation like Silk Road or Game Over Zeus, and we would sit down with 16 or 18 countries. And it was all about, you know, how can we find common ground? How do we trust each other with certain things and certain levels? The company, the private sector victims are wanting to do the same. Yesterday I brought a major client of ours over to see Sean and the team because they wanted to understand how would a national security threat play out. So we brought the general counsel and their top reports in, and they spent you know, time with us explaining how they would work, what kinds of things, you know, are people gonna come in in raid jackets and take over our building? Are you gonna issue a press release that blindsides us and makes us look you know, like a fool in front of our shareholders, regulators, and everyone? If we share something with you, how will you use it? Who else will you share it with? Um, if we are hit and we want to go out and do our own dark web activity or searches or gather threat intelligence, where are the lines there? What can we do and where do we cross it? So these conversations are best had in a time of peace and not in the fog of war. And so that's a little preview of the victim issues. Now, how common is it that you're, that you, uh, you're working with a client of yours prior to an event where you're advising them on incident response, planning, developing these relationships. Is, this, is that the outlier that you just described or is that becoming more common? For the more sophisticated clients, it's becoming more normal. And you know, people are realizing they're in this you know, digital Darwinism era, era where if you try to hunker down and stick your head in the sand, you know, it's not gonna work out. It's not a long time game. So the first thing the GC said yesterday is, we're a when and not if company.
you know, it's going to happen to us. If you got anything to sell, any valuable data, valuable uh, intellectual property or anything, you're going to be on someone's target list. If you're not being targeted, I think you need to find a more, you know, profitable line of business or something <laughs> because uh, you're on the menu, you're on someone's target menu, and it's a question of how high up the food chain you are as a target. And so they came in with a right attitude. And if I can just add to that, I mean, when people ask, how do I prepare for a cyber attack? The, the first thing I say is hire a former CSEPs attorney that's in the private practice now. <laughs> but the, the second thing is, is go to cybercrime.gov and read the best practices for victim response. And it really does talk about building these relationships in a time of peace be ahead of it, do those things ahead of time, and think about what information you'll be able to share with law enforcement before you're faced with that very vulnerable feeling of, I've already lost control of this information, I'm not ready to let anybody else have it, even the FBI. Yeah, it's very hard to think clearly in a business continuity uh, disaster type of scenario. So actually, I'll continue to pull this thread a little bit, uh, slightly out of order on my, my roadmap here. Um, so in terms of uh, an affected organization managing their incident response process, um, uh, so back to, to Luke, uh, how, how do you recommend that they uh, interact with some of these third-party providers? Perhaps they don't have a huge uh, incident response team internally. Maybe they're working with a, a company that does this for hire, or maybe a threat intelligence firm. And then also the, the role of of firms like yours, outside counsel, how does that whole system work? So I think the best prepared of our clients, they have those vendors, the Mandiants, CrowdStrikes, or whomever of the world, they have them retained through us as outside counsel or their preferred outside counsel for, you know, really for, for two reasons. One is attorney-client privilege is most obvious because now when you announce your data breach by 10 a.m., you will be sued by 4 p.m. You will be sued in a class action in Florida, Seventh Circuit or the Ninth Circuit, 11th, 7th or 9th, you'll be sued by 4 p.m. Sorry. So you, if you aren't ready um, with a privilege mentality and an evidence preservation mentality that an attorney brings, you're hosed, to use a technical legal term. <laughs> the other thing is these are high-speed <clears throat> excuse me, internal investigations. It, you know, the, the prior generation of attorneys that came to this space <clears throat> were predominantly privacy and compliance lawyers. They are very important and still needed. We have them on my team. But they were more ready to receive the facts from the forensic team and say, okay, you have to make notification in Iowa, you know, Tennessee, and Belgium. You know, we'll send out the letters. I don't want to demean them, but I mean, their major was not, how do we craft the forensics to prove the negative? If we know that APT-10 doesn't really target PII in the 75 prior FBI investigations because we called these guys and they told us that because we knew who to call and what to ask, we know that we can have a, have a good position with auditors and regulators that they weren't looking for those droids on these servers. They were after our IP. That's their plan. So understanding the threat space, being able to speak about forensics and design an internal investigation to possibly create better legal options on the back end is what my you know, breed of cyber lawyer does. And then the privacy gurus can take that and say, all right, now with this more nuanced view of the facts, we can see here and here where we have notification considerations and here are the risks. Okay, so um, your, your mention of, of perhaps APT-10 and understanding what they're after uh, is a great a lead into this question, which is, is, is attribution, figuring out who is behind a particular act. How's that, are, are we doing better at that? Is that becoming easier or harder? What's the state of play, Mick? It's definitely getting harder. Um, it, it got a lot harder on the criminal side when Tor became sort of standard for a lot of crimes. Um, but even when we were dealing with proxies, and there were proxies far before Tor, um, the electronic trail could be difficult, but we still had the money trail. And I think a lot of cyber crimes in the past 10 years or so were solved through following the money trail. 
and not the electronic trail. And that is going away now, going away now too with virtual currencies. So when you have these mass market ways to anonymously transfer value, um, it has enabled new crimes like ransomware and it has made investigations more difficult. But uh, lest I leave you with the impression that it's hopeless, there's no need to report a cyber crime, you can just hire Luke and, and feel like you can sleep well at night at that point because you've covered yourself. It, the truth is, is that we are still solving significant cyber crimes. Just take a look at the last two weeks. We announced one of the largest data breaches in history was conducted by a charged in individual in China, the Anthem breach. We took down one of the largest referral services that were referring people to the dark net and were taking money according to the allegations in order to drive traffic to illegal narcotic sites. And all the way across the Atlantic in The Hague at the European Cybercrime Center, it was announced that there was a group of six different international bodies or countries that uh, collaborated to take down the uh, Goznim criminal network. So you now have cyber criminals who are being prosecuted not only in the United States, and we still are prosecuting a significant number of them in the United States, you're seeing cyber crime prosecutions, successful ones, and ones with significant deterrent value in countries like Moldova, like Ukraine, like Bulgaria. So these are places that really weren't prosecuting cybercrime to the same extent 10 years ago, and yet today, because of capacity building, they're able to accomplish these things on their own. That's great. Um, Will, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I, I, would, I would agree that absolutely. I think attribution is getting more difficult in, in general. Um, I'd say there's a number of ways that we combat that. Collaboration is clearly one of them. Uh, data is incredibly important. A really, really high-end cyber criminal um, might not have been such a high-end cyber criminal, might not have been so careful um, three, five, ten years previously. Um, and then overlaying humans with what we know, human intelligence. What can people tell us? What can the lower-level individuals tell us in this? And so, um, yeah, well, you, as the scale of this gets bigger, um, attribution in general gets more difficult, but actually we were maintaining an operational tempo um, it is still possible in this space, um, and delivering operational results uh, is still very achievable. Great. Uh, well, Sean's been quite quiet uh, to fill in the panel up to this point, but it's time to pivot to him. So, so far we've discussed cybercrime, but recently the Justice Department's been making news by seeking criminal charges against individuals acting at the behest of a foreign government. Uh, so, Sean, what's the thinking behind this? Um, thanks, Steve. Uh, so I, I'd actually say it hasn't been that recent now. It's but been 2014 when we brought our charges. That's five years ago. It's not, not too recent in my mind. So we've been doing this for a while. But uh, I think back then, um, I'd say pre-2014, we brought our first uh, case against nation state actors. We charged five members of the People's Liberation Army um, with, among other crimes, intellectual property theft um, through hacking. Um, prior to that time, I think the Bureau and the Department had uh, gotten really good at figuring out who, what these actors were up to and, and watching and figuring out their modus operandi. Um, the issue was that that, that is very valuable, um, and I think that's a traditional CI approach to a national security threat, a counterintelligence approach to a national security threat. Um, at some point in time, I think leadership, rightfully so, said, okay, the traditional CI approach of you watch the adversary, learn what they're doing, figure out what their network is, wait for them to go visit a dead drop in the middle of the night, and then you know maybe figure out who their sources are, was not working in the cyber realm because, and it sounds cliche, but people are, things were happening at the speed of cyber. And so you would watch these actors and figure out who they are and what they're up to using all your intelligence collection methods. Uh, and while you're watching them, they're sucking out you know millions of dollars you know, some even go higher than that, of intellectual property and other valuable information from our, you know, private companies, clear defense contractors, and things along those lines. So uh, pre-2014, uh, leadership decided there had to be a, a switch. We'd still take that CI approach, and it was still necessary, but we would be better at figuring out when to, sw to switch to a disruption and deterrent effect operations. And so one of the methods, because uh, the Department of Justice and the FBI are law enforcement uh, agencies, was thinking we should be bringing the rigor and intensity of our criminal investigations to the CI threat, and using that as one of many tools to uh, disrupt and deter these actors. Um, so 
that's what we decided to do. Number one, you know, we'll try to arrest these hackers. Um, granted, when they're either intelligence officers or working for an intelligence service from a effectively a, a safe haven in their home countries, uh, we do have uh, a very low chance of arresting a lot of these actors, and we recognize that. Um, but uh, we felt that there was still a disruption to turn effect from bringing criminal cases, or just at the very least, taking a, an investigative approach, like a criminal investigative approach to these to these actors. Um, and there's other ways to disrupt them. And the idea behind that is, number one, you give, you kind of, you contest the space. You don't make it a zero cost approach for these hackers, which it kind of was. They could just sit there and, and lob, you know, spear phishing emails at entities or try to, you know, watering hole attacks and things along those lines with very little risk of being caught, identified, um, or disrupted. And so now we're just raising the cost, contesting the space. Um, it gives the network defenders some breathing room. Um, it, uh, we help pitch information from our investigations to those network defenders so they can better defend themselves. Um, but with regard to the adversaries and their decision, their decision making calculus, they now have to insert in their minds, am I truly as anonymous as I think I am? Will my future be as carefree as I hope it would be? Can I travel these places when I want to? Maybe if I want to give up being a hacker someday and go work for a reputable company, can I do that? Uh, these are all things that we're now putting in their minds and hopefully, you know, as part of other efforts we'll discuss uh, later on, starting to change that cost-benefit calculus and having a deterrent effect um, with, with a lot of these adversaries, even in the national security space. Um, so what is the relationship between the types of cases you're charging and the, the norms that we heard about earlier, either from the 2013 or 2015 Group of Governmental Experts uh, uh, report? Uh, and then also kind of related to that, are we concerned that other nations will want to criminally charge U.S. government employees that may be doing things that violate their domestic laws? So what's the relationship there between what we charge and, and expected state behavior? Right. So uh, if you actually take a look at a lot of our, uh, our cases that have been public, um, that we've done out of the National Security Division working with U.S. Attorney's offices around the country, you actually notice that a lot of those cases probably track uh, many of the norms that have been out there uh, through group of governmental experts and whatnot, uh, or through other you know, international uh, kind of consensus building um, entities. So for example, we have had a lot of cases targeting the theft of intellectual property um, for the benefit of foreign, uh, foreign companies um, by state-sponsored actors. Uh, that's something that um, I think we in the United States have been talking about for a long Long time, and a lot of our partners and allies have, for many years now, been saying the same thing, which is, you know, granted, espionage is a traditional tool of statecraft. It's everyone does spy. I think, uh, you know, even President Obama said at the time. But what we th we think there's certain red lines uh, as an international community that should not be crossed, and that was one of them. You shall not steal intellectual property for the benefit of your own um, your own companies or state-owned enterprises and things along those lines. So you see a lot of our cases that are that are coming out publicly. Um, do tend to track those norms. You've had other cases, you know, thou shall not attack critical infra thou shall not attack critical infrastructure in peacetime. We have several cases where we have uh, actors, um, I can think of the Iranian DDoS attacks against the financial sector that were done uh, on behalf of the Iranian, uh, sorry, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. Um, same thing. These are types of cases where we're saying that is the type of activity that we believe countries should not engage in in peacetime, and you'll see a lot of our national security type cases track that to help reinforce those red lines, um, both with our partners and in our adversaries' eyes. And in which case we're making a policy statement that the U.S. does not itself do those things. Yes, absolutely. Um, so that brings me to your second question, which is, you know, do we have a fear that our own operators will be uh, on the receiving end of, of criminal charges in another country? Um, so I go back to the point of, of what I said. I think that there is all countries spy. Um, that's, that's, an, that's something that is normal, and we hope that our countries are gathering intelligence um, to better protect uh, ourselves down the road. But uh, what our intelligence agencies do not do are those types of things that we are saying other countries should not do, which is attack uh, critical infrastructure in peacetime, steal intellectual property from a, let's say, a Chinese uh, aerospace giant and hand it over to Boeing or Airbus. We just do not do those things. Um, and so I think we tend to stay on the right side of those lines, or what we believe are the lines. But at the end of the day, I mean, personally, I have a hard time buying the fact that if that foreign governments or adversaries maybe are not charging our, our operators um, out of some sort of uh, uh, trying to recognize norms. I have a feeling if they can identify the adversaries, they would 
engage in their own cost benefit analysis and charge them regardless of what the Department of Justice and the FBI are doing in this space. Okay, so uh, we're on a little bit of the home stretch for uh, my guided discussion, and then we'll pivot into uh, question and answer, but uh, a couple, just a couple more things. So back to Luke, uh, for an organization that's been the victim of what might appear to be a state-sponsored attack, are there special considerations that they would have in mind or need to be able to navigate um, in the incident response phase that would be different from if it was a pure financially motivated criminal attack, um, and, and especially if, if you're working with the Justice Department and there's a discussions around whether, you, whether your client would be willing to be named in a public charging document as being the victim of a state-sponsored attack. Yeah, a lot of considerations. One is, um, you know, do you have cleared personnel, people with clearances or access to them to be able to go into classified space and find out a little bit more, whatever the government might share about the nature of what's hit you. Um, you may be served with national security process. I mean, normally as a victim, the approach is a voluntary one as far as that can go, but it's conceivable that your client could receive uh, what's called a FISA warrant or um, issued pursuant to the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court uh, or an NSL, a national security letter, which is the rough equivalent of a criminal subpoena. And there are specific rules about who you can share these with and how you respond. And, you know, you can't just run off to your board and tell everyone in your HR department about this. Um, you could be crossing legal lines there. So. There's some sophistication required in preparation for the response to this. Um, in terms of the uh, media aspect and what you're, you're, you're uh, asking about, Steve, it is a big consideration to have your client named in an indictment that points a finger at a major foreign country. Um, because you may have business operations there or dealings there, and the retaliation risk could be high. And so a lot of our clients are very worried about those issues. You know, they, they want to get justice, so to speak, or at least make it better for their stakeholders. They want to do the right thing as a participant in critical infrastructure and, and broadly, you know, from, from that standpoint but they're also worried about the collateral damage and retaliation risk. Okay. Uh, uh, just on the, uh, going back to the question you asked me earlier about attribution, and you talk about, um, uh, you know, whether you as a company have been hit by uh, a particular nation state. I think when you suffer a major incident uh, as a company that could be a national security or a criminal um, risk uh, out there, I think it's, on that attribution point of uh, uh, perspective, it's, it's taking a longer period of time to figure that out. And actually, with the emergence of these hybrid actors, could you have actually been the victim of kind of like both at once? Um, so I think that's just an interesting point. As in, you know, how do you uh, how do you deal with it as a business? Are you going to be subject to national security process or, or criminal process, or, or or you know, actually, or, or a mixture of both? I think that's getting a little bit more complicated. I think those lines in the road are are, are no longer as clear cut as they used to be. Right. Okay, well, I'd like to, to wrap this up, maybe back to you, Will, with a, with a final question. Um, that uh, Sean made a, a pretty compelling case for, for why the U.S. has taken the, the tack that it has with uh, trying to deter malicious cyber activities by states with, with criminal charges. Uh, what are some other ways that we can achieve deterrence in cyberspace? Um, I think there's an enormous... Uh, toolbox that we have at our disposal um, here to to kind of like counter that that malign behaviour, um, and 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 that can really be uh, uh, anything that that associates a cost to that particular piece of activity. So, um, for me, it's not just about delivering specific tools like indictments or or, or U.S. Treasury sanction designations. It's about um, two things. Firstly, it's about using a blend of those tools all at once. Um, so making your response uh, multi multifaceted. Uh, and secondly, it's about doing that in a really collaborative way. Um, we are finding that we are conducting all of this activity as coalitions of people 
people that all believe in these types of norms in cyberspace. So, you know, I don't want to go into particular types of, of ways that we can counter this, but I'd say that actually uh, as a community moving forward, um, we're using a blend of those different tools all at once, and we're doing that in a much more collaborative international way. Um, if you don't do that, uh, I think we found, particularly in the criminal side, that um, uh, you, you risk potentially driving an evolution in the sophistication of the adversary's tactics, um, because if you hit them with the same thing every time, uh, uh, th they will evolve to, to, to nullify that tactic that they can use against you. Another good point. Okay, Sean, yeah. quickly, and then we'll move I'll on to questions. Very quickly on that. I think that that's a fabulous point. Um, and I, I just draw some public examples of this recently. We've had, uh, I think, two instances recently in the national security context where we've had more of a kind of a coalition of international, I mean, an international coalition of like-minded countries that have come out to, to speak about some malicious state-sponsored uh, behavior in cyberspace. The first one was uh, in October 2018. Um, there was a Russian operation to go after anti-doping agencies and to put information about athletes out on the internet. Uh, somewhat was kind of tweaked in a way to make it look worse than it was. Uh, and uh, that was through a cooperation of, uh, I think, the, the United Kingdom, um, Canada, the RCMP were a very important partner in there, and uh, also the Dutch military intelligence, which, you know, go back two years uh, ago, you would never have seen, uh, I think, that type of cooperation on a national security uh, threat, um, especially with regard to a foreign military intelligence agency cooperating with an American law enforcement agency to counter one of these threats. And I think it's, 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 it's a really good, useful example. And then more recently, the APT-10 indictments, there were probably about 12 or 15 countries that came out together with statements, not just the Five Eyes, the, you know, the US, UK, New Zealand, and Australia, but in Canada, but like other countries in Europe and Asia that came out and said this activity emanating from China is unacceptable and we think that um, it should cease. And so I think that's a very positive trend. Great, great point. Okay, so we have probably about 10 minutes for questions and we have microphone holders and so because we are being live streamed and also so that folks can hear, please do use the mics. So I see a hand here and if you'd make sure that you do ask a question and not give a speech and then uh, we're gonna, we'll have one of our speakers address it and then we'll move on to the next question so we won't all five try to answer your question. Go I ahead. guess I address, address this primarily to Michael. In terms of law enforcement response to sophisticated uh, cybercrime, what are some of the uh, investigations investigative tools that are most important in solving these crimes? So if I can change your question just a little bit, it's not so much the investigative tools, it's what do we have to do to make a difference and make an impact on people not doing this crime? I think what we need to do is solve a lot more than what we are now. Um, I, I'm not a criminologist, uh, but I'm starting to be educated on some of the literature that says that the certainty of punishment is a lot more effective than the length of punishment. I've put people in their 20s uh, before the court to be sentenced, who, and they've received 10, 12, 14 years. Um, I, I'm increasingly convinced that that may not have been the greatest deterrent message we could have given rather than have 10 or 15 of these individuals before the court so that they were all being punished for somewhat less amount of time. The, the problem is the easy cost effective thing for Congress to do is increase penalties. And that shows they're serious about cybercrime. I think to be serious about cybercrime, we've got to have a lot more cyber investigators. We've got to retain the experience ones we have, maybe even with increased pay. And we've got to here, have here. <laughs> and, and, and we've just got to have a lot, lot more of them. Great. Uh, I see, uh, let's see, I think you had your hand up earlier, right? So we'll come back here. Uh, this is a quick question. Uh, what about if a victim got an email and the sender says, you know, I have your password and your, par your password is the following. And if you don't give me one hundred dollars, I'm gonna use it to, I mean, to steal your identity. What should be the answer or the reaction, or what should the victim do in in, in such a case? Can I ask our moderator to step into the role? Because I know the FBI has 
as guidance on when you're being extorted over the internet? Yeah, we, we typically don't recommend paying extortions. That's the official line. Um, if they say they have your password, I would immediately seek to, to change all your account passwords uh, on that account and any other account that may resemble it. Um, but um, and then also report that report that incident to um, the Internet Crime Complaint Center because we are aggregating a large number of of small individual. Uh, incidents and losses so that we can put together larger cases. Um, but I guess it depends whether the person's offering proof that they're in your account or whether they're just blowing smoke. But definitely uh, have have good practices on, on your two-factor authentication. If, if your email service or your brokerage account offers it, use it. It's quite a, quite a great uh, countermeasure for preventing that sort of thing. Uh, but we don't recommend paying ransoms because you're fueling the very activity that we're trying to prevent. And uh, I let's let's go to Mary, and then we're going to come here next. Hi, I'm Mary Greer. I work at the ABA Rule of Law Initiative, and I wanted to follow up, Mick, on your observations on the the evolution of technical assistance, at least over the 15 years that CSIPS has been providing such great services. And do you have any reflections for us, and, and I want to include all the, the panelists, on what the constellation is, what's been more effective and not, um, typical training models, uh, capacity building, you know, the multi-agency approach. And I also, in, and um, Will had made the good point that it's beyond the enforcement rubric, and I'm wondering, you know, again, within the confines of rule of law technical assistance, other things that we should be doing or thinking of doing or stop doing? I think the first thing that I would say is that I do think that capacity building is incredibly important. Um, in fact, the State Department has been wonderful in using some of the money that they're allocated to actually fund Department of Justice attorneys to go out and do that. We've started with one or two here or there, mostly focused on intellectual property, but we have just created the first global law enforcement network of international computer hacking and intellectual property liaison prosecutors. That's a lot of words, but we just call them the Glen of I chips. Um, and the Glen of iChips is going to be a dozen federal prosecutors fanned out across the world in Panama, in Brazil, in Croatia, in, uh, including one that will be stationed at the European Cybercrime Center specifically to address Eastern European transnational organized cybercrime, working collaboratively with the collection of the European police and prosecutors who gather there in The Hague. So as far as what we should be focused on, I think one thing is we tend to do more comprehensive training across all of the necessary levels, investigator, prosecutor, and judges. I think judges are the ones getting the least amount of training right now. I think investigators actually probably are getting the best training. Prosecutors are getting some training, and we hope to improve it significantly with the Glen of iChips. But judges are getting less training, and ultimately, the, all of these cases, if we're successful, are headed to a court. So I, I think judicial training is critical. Um, on the capacity building front, I, I, I mean, lots of different countries, lots of different agencies around the world have a, a range of different really, really excellent capacity building programs. One thing that I think we're probably not very good at is coordinating those together. Um, are the NCA in a particular country providing a, a forensics course that the FBI or the DOJ provided to this, a similar group of people two years earlier? Um, uh, and uh, so, so that's what I say on the capacity building front. And secondly, um, uh, it's not all just about enforcement. Like cybercrime is the one crime if the, of all of them that you're not going to arrest your way out of this problem. Um, and actually 98%, 99% of people could protect themselves by just undertaking some really basic cybersecurity hygiene, cybersecurity measures. And actually that remaining one or 2% are going to be victims if you have good cyber hygiene or not. Um, so, you know, we should be utilizing operational successes better to put that protect message out there. Um, uh, so yeah, I mean, the two halves of the, of, of the same coin there. Thanks, Will. Okay, so we're coming here. 
Uh, Bill Marisak from Citizen Lab. Uh, one question that I had for you know both on the criminal side and the nation state side is uh, so the, this question of commercialization. Um, so clearly it's reducing barriers to, to entry for conducting cybercrime as well as nation state attacks. But do you see this uh, in your work uh, as introducing any sort of opportunities for you to improve your investigations or to better hold people to account? Uh, so at Citizen Lab, when we're tracking uh, nation states targeting uh, dissidents in civil society, commercialization is, is sort of very helpful in that once you've seen one instance of an attack or one actor using a commercial tool, it's much easier to, to map out the entire extent of that activity and uncover other, other attacks. Sean, do you have any views on that? Yeah, I think uh, that you raise the, the advantage of commercialization for being able to figure out what's going on and who's doing what. But again, I think it, it kind of goes back to the point we made about cyber criminal underground and you know these these people who who have established their niche. Like these these companies are now enabling, um, I think, foreign intelligence services or law enforcement services all around the world to get into the game of, of, of cyber um, investigations. And you know some of them just don't have the same rule of law protections that we like to have, that we have here and in a lot of other countries around the world. I think that's where that, that friction is, is, is posing problems, um, significant problems. Yeah, I think it's really interesting. I mean, it allows the various actors, whether you be a criminal or nation state, to go in and do what you want to achieve at a low risk and a low cost. Um, but at the same time, it, it presents some sort of opportunity to, to us as, as, as law enforcement or, or investigators across the piece. As in, actually, if you if you have visibility on a on a criminal on a service that they all utilise, then obviously that's 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 a real investigative advantage. Okay, I think we have one more question in the back. I saw a hand earlier. Yes, you, and then this will be it. Um, this is a follow-up question on uh, ransomware. Uh, there was an NPR piece this morning on Baltimore and the whole city being shut down by ransomware and in Atlanta being hit earlier. Um, Baltimore does not have the resources to deal with it. How do you, they're even looking at possibly going back to paper for house transactions. Um, what recommendations do you have for cities with limited resources? Well, ransomware is a huge, huge problem and we are seeing uh, that which would be uh, presumed to be a cyber crime offense maybe that would be aimed at uh, the normal individual starting to hit uh, critical infrastructure owners and operators, towns, that sort of thing. Uh, we, we DHS and FBI have put out uh, ransomware advice out there on US CERT and other websites. I know uh, with, with Baltimore, uh, our folks are working on that with, with, the, with the city. Um, it's a major problem and, and, and uh, organizations need to be postured to be able to deal with, 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 that, with that issue. Um, so it's hard for me to diagnose that from afar. Anybody else want to weigh in on, on the problem of ransomware? I, I would just say there are many, many resources out there. Some of them are more expensive than others, but certainly one that is heavily involved when there's something like that happening is the Department of Homeland Security. It's less of the law enforcement concern where we are concerned about trying to find out who did it, but it is DHS that are, if you want to give the analogy to the policeman and the firefighter, they're the ones who are trying to assist in the recovery of an event like that. And so really, it's our Department of Homeland Security, I think, that would be most involved. Just one word on that from the private sector experience is, you know, preventing it, segmenting your network, all those things. But the real coin of the realm for our clients, no pun intended, has been ability to restore from backups. You know, and if it's just a mirrored rolling backup, that's going to be encrypted as well. So it's expensive to store a snapshot and to keep a periodic snapshot. But when our clients have the snapshot, they can restore back to that snapshot and they can come back and they'll lose maybe some days or hours. And that's expensive for a government to think about, but the alternatives are far more expensive to me. So I think maybe it needs to be an investment in that, along with all of the hygiene and segmentation steps, cleaning up RDP connections, dealing with phishing and trying to raise the game on all of that from a prevention standpoint, but having the backups as a fallback. Well, thank you very much, panel. And th thank you, Mary and Linda.